Good morning. Please be seated. It's a great joy to be with you this morning, and um, thank you all for, for having me. My wife, Tina, and I were looking at the scriptures today, and um, you know, I was going to do some prayer over it, and I wanted to get her just maybe input and in thinking, because she's always way smarter than I am. And that gospel reading, Matthew 20, about the vineyard owner, beautifully proclaimed, thank you, um, all of a sudden, she got excited. I'm like, what? do you like this scripture? Do you like how it ends? You know, the last shall be first, first shall be last. She said, no, wait, are you getting to preach about wine? The, the vineyard? And I'm like, no, 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 no sermon about wine or vineyards. Not at all. Um, but it was a thought. Um, and I, you know, through the services today, uh, it's occurred to me even more and deeper and deeper. That reading from Exodus 16 um, is probably one of the foundational stories for our work that we get to do every day in hunger and food insecurity. Right? The, gum, the grumbling congregation, all of Israel, out in the wilderness, and they were hungry. They were hungry. And what did God do? God rained down bread from heaven. Right? What a beautiful, beautiful um, foundational story for our incredible work. I have a couple of things I want to share with you. Two weeks ago, it was the end of lunch, end of an event, and I was thanking and saying goodbye to some people, and out of the corner of my eye, I caught a glimpse of a woman, not somebody I knew, but she was dressed just perfect, like it was Sunday dress, Sunday best, lavender dress, hair was done perfect. She had a corsage on. She was carrying flowers. She approached me. And I could see her just getting closer and closer. Big smile on her face. I mean, just beaming, beaming. As she got right up into my space, I mean, just very, very close, I noticed a couple of things. I noticed her makeup had a smear from tears, which confused me for a minute because of the joy on her face, but also I noticed the sorrow that must have been there at some point because of the tear in her eye. She had a name tag on. Her name was Bernice. And I said, Bernice? She said, Mr. Gira, I have to tell you something. Okay. And she said it with um, kindness but authority. She said, Mr. Gira, he never graduated from anything. This is the first thing he ever finished. He's a man now. I was a bit taken aback, and, but I could see the pride and the, just the, the overjoyedness as she said that about him. He's a man now. He finished something. I said, can I, can I give you a hug? She said, yes, please. And I hugged her, trying not to smash the flowers in the corsage. But just the warmth of her arms wrapped around me, and I could feel the love. And I stepped back for a minute, and she said, he's 53. Well, I stopped, and I started to pull it all together. She was probably the age of my parents, in her mid-80s. Right? She's dressed up in her Sunday best. And we, had, we were there celebrating a graduation, a graduation of men who had finished a culinary training program at the San Antonio Food Bank. And these weren't ordinary men. These were incarcerated individuals. We had a class of 10, 10 men who, at the end of their time in prison, participated in a program we call the Texas Second Chance Program. They came to this graduation in their jumpsuits, from jail. They got to sit with their families, though, at the, at the celebration, at the program. And it was her son who she was referencing, not her grandson, which I thought, or maybe her great-grandson. It was her 53-year-old son who was one of those 10 second-chance graduates. I was a bit floored, but I saw him off to the side. She pointed out who he was. And he had the smile of an 18-year-old. He was standing there taking 
photos with his other um, trustees, as we call them, the inmates who have earned a trustee status to come to the San Antonio Food Bank to work for 16 months and to train. And he looked like an 18 year old and not a 53 year old. And I just had to soak it all in for a little while and really reflect on it. And it was the second chance part of it that stayed with me. That stayed with me as I thought about on heaven as it is on earth. That this incredible God of ours is a God of second chances, right? I started to think that mother, Bernice, and her warm embrace, and her tear of sadness, and her beaming, <coughs> beaming smile of joy, isn't she like our good God, right? That wants to, that stays with us in each time we stumble, that stays with us each time we falter, each time that mistake happens, God is with us, staying with us, loving us, waiting for us to celebrate with us. Usually in my life, it's a lot easier to be the son when I put myself as, which actor am I in that story? Because I know way too many times it's been me, the one who has stumbled, me, the one who's been at fault, me, the one who's made that mistake, and me, the one who's needed forgiveness and needed somebody to be there for me to celebrate, to have a, a tear of compassion and an embrace of joy. That prodigal son is probably easier for me to relate to than that mother in her all forgiving embrace. Second chances. So I ask you just to reflect. Is it easier to be the mother in that story? Is that who you usually identify with? For the son. Because I think about that mother okay, as I think about myself. Every time that I'm challenged to, to not forgive, to hold a grudge, to have that angst inside of me, I think it's easier for me day in and day out to be that, that son than it is to be the all-forgiving, all-loving, compassionate mom, to be Bernice. So I wanted to share that story of Bernice with you. But I want to bookend it with a story of Bella. One Tuesday afternoon, and this was a few years ago, I was in my office, typing away, sorry to get in your space here, typing away in the office, and the receptionist rang my office, and she says, hey, Mr. Guerra, there's someone here that wants to drop off some food from a food drive. Not uncommon, it's like, all right, I'll be right out there. And so I hustle from the desk, and I'm behind now the reception desk, and I look out into the lobby, just like I'm looking at you all, and I don't see anybody. I'm like, well, what's going on? Where's the person with the food drive? And out from the other side of the desk, I see this hand stick up, hi! And I'm like, whoa, hello! <laughs> and there's a little blonde girl, and she's like, hi, I'm Bella, I'm nine. <laughs> I'm like, hi, Bella, I'm Michael, I'm not nine. Um, <laughs> She says, I just had my birthday, and I heard how throughout the summer, kids who were not in school were missing meals, that they were hungry. And I told my parents for my ninth birthday, for my party, and I had a good party, nobody to bring presents for me, just bring food that I can help for the food bank. I'm like, oh my gosh, Bella, seriously? That's awesome. She's like, yeah, and there's mom and dad. And I look over and they're sitting on the couch kind of there while Bella's doing her show with me. And they both had to drive because we got so much food at the birthday party that we filled up both their trunks. I'm like, you are my hero, Bella. I love you, like, come here. So we're taking pictures, you know, social media, all the, all the stuff. And we go on, and this, this is the incredible miracle that we get to witness every day. Kids, adults, you name it, right? A year later, almost to the day, in the office, typing away, you know, at the computer. And the receptionist calls me. Mr. Guerra. Yes? You remember that girl last year who did the food drive? I'm like, Bella? She's back. I'm like, boom, boom. I go out. This time I know a little better. I'm like, hey, hi, I'm Bella. I'm 10. <laughs> I'm like, okay, Bella, way to go. You aged up. You got double digits now. Way to go. She's like, Mr. Guerra, you know, I didn't have that birthday party thing like last year, but I thought a little bit kind of bigger thing, I got my entire third grade to raise food for the food bank this year. I'm like, Bella, what? Yeah, so she's like, yep, 
I raised so much food that just dad had to drive, but he drove a U-Haul today. <laughs> I'm like, all right, Bella, way to go. Bring it in. So we go and we check Bella in and you know they, they're unloading the food. And, and there's like, this kid is like gonna be my fundraising hero. I'm like, you're gonna be on my team. Come on, like, I love you. A year later, a year later, you know where it's going. Um, we got, I got a call at the desk. Mr. Guerra, yeah. Hey, listen, this is Bella's mom. I'm like, oh, hello, how are you? It's like, Bella has this idea for her 11th birthday. She wants to get the entire school to donate food for those kids who didn't have meals in the summer. And we wanted to see if we could have one of your 18 wheelers come to her school so she could fill it up. I'm like, really? I'm like, yep, that's what she wants to do. So sure enough, get that call, driver shows up, Bella shows up, her parents, the news, the media. I'm like, Bella, you are my hero. Like, she literally got her entire school, her elementary school, for her 11th birthday to bring in food. Mom and dad supporting her in the wings. She, uh, to this day, actually, is the youngest recipient of our Hunger Fighter of the Year Award. Uh, after that year, I'm like, okay, Bella, <laughs> we're gonna do all we can to tell your story and to recognize the incredible generosity that you as a nine, 10, and now 11-year-old have given in our community. She's an inspiration. And, I, and it occurred to me, you know, the, the scripture about to enter the kingdom of heaven, we must become like the little child, right? We must become as the child. And man, so many times in my life, at least, it's a lot easier to be adulting than it is to be like Bella, you know? To be skeptical. Why aren't those parents working? Why do we really need to give them food? And that's what I do for a job, right? But just to be adulting rather than to have the heart and the eye of a child. To really let that live through me. And so as I looked at the actors in that story, there's Bella, of course, but then there's mom and dad. And, and as I thought about it, in my day-to-day -day walk with God, I think maybe too often I'm like mom and dad. I'm helping, but I'm just kind of on the side driving along, you know, working on the halo of Bella. <laughs> but I think the call, as I really try and internalize it, of heaven on earth is to allow that childlike innocence and response to be Bella, to let that live more than just the parent. And so I leave that with you. I leave you Bernice at one end of the spectrum at 85 or so, and little Bella as a child at 9, 10, and 11. On earth as it is in heaven, as we move forward to consecrate not just a Sunday or a series, but every moment, every word, every action of our lives to our great God. Many blessings. Thank you for having me today. <laughs> Thank you, Jake.